that today. Um, where we um, were talking about um, um, air quality, so because it was uh, Clean Air Day today in the UK. So yeah, I'm in UK in Gloucestershire. Uh, I'm quite passionate about it. I've got a small business um, making uh, a range of sustainable eco cleaning products, which I've used in a successful small cleaning business. But uh, yeah, so I'm Wendy and. Uh, I'm Wendy Goes Green, but I'm really interested in what's happening with this app and I'm glad to be part of this tonight. Awesome. Thanks so much, Wendy. Uh, great to have you here. And uh, um, hopefully we can connect uh, later on uh, more uh, as well. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to say a quick hi uh, before we get going. Um, Otherwise, maybe there's a bit of time at the end as well. We'll just jump and say hi uh, if you feel like it. Um, otherwise, I think we're about time to, to get cracking. So I'm just recording this uh, so we can send it out to everyone else who can't make it today, if that's all right. Um, so uh, hopefully uh, many of you uh, were here in the last call uh, and saw the climate scientists. We've got Arki from then. Uh, who will uh, introduce, introduce his presentation. Then John will do a bit. Uh, he's got a lot of uh, experience on the political side of things um, and uh, content, a uh, global content editor for XR and new position, which uh, I think you, you'll be able to say much better than me. Um, and uh, we've got a few other team that I can, uh, from the team that I can introduce as well. And then after this, I'll... Uh, I'll give it a quick introduction uh, or quick demonstration of the app. I can, I can screen share it. Uh, and then uh, please feel free to ask lots of uh, questions and we'll try and get through as many of them as possible. Um, but without further ado, um, John Arkey, really quickly, do you want to give a one line introduction to this talk? And then after that, we'll jump to you, Arki. I'll find out. And would everyone would everyone oh, mind put um, going on mute as well, please? Uh, do it from now oh, on. I don't mind actually, either. Or I will take the uh, liberty and do it for you. <laughs> um, but yeah, John, I'll throw it over to you in one sentence. Can you give an introduction, please? Give it a go. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so I guess this is a talk which is exploring two sides of the energy debate, the practical physical element of it, what are we currently able to do with the technology and the science we have available, and then the other side of it is, well, why aren't we implementing these new technologies, what are the barriers that are stopping us from doing this, and what are the opportunities that we have as a society within politics to make these things happen. That was perfect. I have nothing to add. Uh, there's two sides of the same coin. And uh, of course, energy is highly politicized topic because energy is what gets not just economy in general going, it's just what's all, all of us going. Without energy, we can't do things. Because without the energy, we can't live even. So this is why this is super important. It's a combination of physics. It's a combination of politics, social, aspects environment all that of course a lot of history here so uh yeah i think i think this is john i i, I can't actually add like i could i couldn't i couldn't formulate it better than john so i'm just a physicist he's 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 he knows he knows better actually right and I'll, I'll just quickly read out both your bios and then i'll throw it over to you aki so aki holds a phd in physics came from the institute of thermodynamics uh a syrian branch of the russian academy of sciences with a major in thermal physics and theoretical uh, thermal engineering. He worked as a postdoc research fellow uh, at Japanese University Kyushu, um, studying applied superconductivity, uh, and later moved to Australia to join a privately funded project of a large superconducting homopolar generator. Uh, currently studies and designs electric propulsion systems, and is particularly interested in light electric vehicles uh, in general, and electric bicycles. Um, 
he also loves cycling and rides push bikes a lot and doesn't own a car. Uh, and John, John is an environmental activist and occasional jazz singer, currently completing the final year of politics in the International Studies degree, we'll pretty much finish that now, uh, with experience as a campaigner for NGOs, uh, as an activist on the streets and global content editor for Extinction Rebellion. He is passionate about environmental and social justice issues and believes that the climate crisis represents not only an existential threat, but a massive opportunity to problemize uh, and change the way we interact with, the, uh, with each other and the world around us. Um, please add to that if there's anything new. Um, but uh, for now, I'll throw it over to you, Arki. We'll have about uh, 25 to 30 minutes from Arki, 15 minutes from John, then we'll have uh, five minutes on the app and then 10 minutes a QA, and a and we can extend that as well if people want to hang around after that for more questions and answers. So thank you very much. Over to you, Aki. Okay, I'm going to share my screen right now. And I'm going to start my presentation. Uh, how, do I, how do I hide the, the small... Okay, something like this. The politics of physics and of sustain the politics and physics of sustainable energy. This is the, our general uh, topic of our presentation, and we are going to try to answer the question: Is it possible to power the world without warming the climate? Probably all noticed that I used. I'm using a old typewriter font face. This is not a coincidence. I wanted you to have, well, I wanted to see, show that this is a really old topic. Uh, I mean, first of all, it's really cool, but I wanted to show that this was really old topic. I didn't want to show you uh, any slick designs. Uh, I don't, didn't want to show you too much green. Uh, I want you to be very much concentrated because there's quite a few, uh, quite a few of uh, 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 hidden hidden messages in in this in this in this presentation. So just be attentive. Try to not to miss out. So keep focused, and uh, yeah, let's let's get going. Uh, you know, probably probably you're wondering why I am using this strange. Uh, slide and switch to a strange quotation, but I'm pretty sure you can find all the answers all this on this page. And seemingly unrelated next slide, uh, just again to show you, to you that I really like the style of early 19, late, late 19, early 20th century presentation uh, and, and scientific publication. And later in the presentation, I'm going to try to transform the muscular work into the measurable units and to demonstrate them to you. And actually, I'm going to try to break down the energy we use into the measurable units. And before I start, I just want to give you a little bit of a disclaimer. I'm a competent and experienced experimental physicist. As a scientist, I am professionally trained to apply critical thinking, understand numbers, adhere to scientific accuracy. Of course, scientific profession requires strong logic and consistent argument, and the ability to change beliefs in presence if presented with sufficient, with sufficient evidence. Further, this is not just my profession, the search for truth is to a great extent who I am, the part of my identity. Suboptimal rational behavior in people bothers me a lot. And disclaimer continued. Yet, I am not completely impartial. I need to warn you. I believe that preservation of livable environment and creation of a more equitable world for many generations is more important than unlimited personal freedoms, in particular freedoms to consume and creation of unimaginable, or should I say imaginary wealth. Uh, I believe that we can't consume our way out of the environmental crisis, no matter what politicians and businesses try to sell you under the green brand, uh, I'm sorry to say that, but if you believe what they say, you are a simpleton. Sustainable world is the world that conserves energy and resources and, res and respects the environment. By default, I don't believe anything that national leaders, politicians, and corporate leaders say about saving the planet. They almost never deliver on, on environmental promises, thus they lost any credibility. 
politics, public relations, and commercial advertisement are three activities where lies and manipulations have become a standard in the industry and such behavior is somehow deemed socially acceptable. Phrase, nothing personal, just business does not justify or excuse intentional harmful acts towards other human beings and or the environment. I believe that linear economy of endless growth of fi on finite resource base is utter madness. And I'm 42 and I had a few romantic dramas in my life, but I never engaged in that very common toxic, toxic relationship with a car. No, really, I don't even know how to drive. I believe that our civilization has a very unhealthy love affair with the private car. And I firmly believe that the dependence on cars significantly impairs our global warming mitigation efforts. Knowing how wasteful and ineffective this mode of transport is, I'm convinced that a sustainably powered world is a carless world. Car free, anyone? Can such relationship become healthy? Probably yes. But this requires a lot of changes from both parties involved. And the last but not the least, I simply love our living planet. And this is the last nice and green image. So just enjoy it before, before I start the presentation. Uh, and our, our living planet, it is so unique and precious. And so I hope one day people will learn to treat it the way they treat their brand new car. Wash it and polish it, avoid the tiniest scratches, protect it from anyone who is trying to damage or steal it, adore the smell and sounds of it, speak to friends about how big and powerful it is and how fast it can go. By the way, the Earth orbital speed is 108,000 kilometers per hour. So back to the question, is it possible to power the world without warming the climate? Uh, is it? Short answer is yes. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? Yeah, I was just kidding. We need to first answer the question, what sustainable energy actually is? What does the term sustainable anything actually mean? And to know that to do that, let's turn to literature, uh, sustainable energy management book. Uh, sustainable development is a recently accepted concept of development that has emerged as a result of the fact that the development of civilization has exhausted natural resources to the extent that the earth has become unsustainable, thus challenging the prospects of development and survival of future generations. So sustainable something is a method of doing some, this something in a such a way as to not mess too much with the global ecosystem of our planet. Thus, unsustainable energy can be defined as the way of generating, transporting, distributing, and consuming useful energy in a way that compromises the sust sustainability, namely short and long-term stability of the life supporting portion of our planet, AKA Her Majesty, the global ecosystem. By contradiction, sustainable energy is exactly the opposite. Now, what is renewable energy? The source of energy that once used can be renewed naturally on a comparatively short time scales of minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, sometimes years. In contrast, non-renewable sources form and thus can renew on geological and even astronomical time scales from one anywhere from one to 100 million of years for fossil fuels or even many billions of years for fissile nuclear fuels. In comparison with historic time scales, decades, centuries, millennia, tens of thousands of years, non-renewable sources take anywhere between 1,000 and 100,000 times longer to form than any reasonable planning horizon and can be effectively considered lost, irreversibly lost uh, once used. One very important remark, sustainable energy does not necessarily mean renewable. Renewable energy is not always sustainable. This is very important to understand. And an extremely important remark, in the most broad and vague colloquial terms, sustainable is approximately equal responsible, whatever the word responsible may mean to you personally. And as such, this is more of an ethical or moral concept rather than anything else. And that is why politics here is of extreme importance. Uh, the big five, this is what we, this is my invention that I call this big five. This is uh, the biggest, the big, probably by far the biggest, the biggest uh, sinks of our energies is where we use energy. That's electricity. Thank you very much, Mr. Faraday for that. Uh, actually by as long as, I don't know if it's, if it's true, uh, more true than, than the apple of Newton, but when Mr. Faraday 
uh, invented or discovered the law, uh, you know, Faraday's law of induction, he was interviewed by a reporter and reporter said, so, so what? You have a coil and you push a magnet into the coil and your meter needle just jumps and then you pull it, pull it out of the coil and your meter needle jumps again. So what about, yeah, you generate some electricity in the wires, so what? And he said, one day they are going to text it. Ah. He was a genius. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's true, but that's really cool because now they're taxing it, and that's that's a backbone of our economy. And then food, uh, growing food for humans, growing feed for animals to make food for humans, processing distribution of food, transport, cars, public transport, place, transportation of stuff, housing, that's construction, maintenance, heating and cooling of living space and stuff. This is industry. And in this talk, I'm going to try to cover a few of them because it's not possible to cover all of them. So I'm going to touch, of course, on electricity, a little bit of food, transport, some housing. Uh, that's not, not much on stuff. So that's, that, that's, that's the plan. So the plan, the plan is mostly, mostly, mostly look at, at the electricity and transport and a little bit on food. So global energy consumption by source. Uh, this is this this is this is this is the this is data from 2011 uh, from International Energy Energy Agency 2013. Uh, not super fresh, but things didn't this patterns didn't change too much, and uh, we can see we can see what's happening. And uh, you know, currently currently it's still 75 to 80, 80 probably two percent depending on how you count of primary energy, energy, energy consumption in the world globally is uh, our fossil fuels. That's oil, coal, coal, natural gas. Wind, solar, geothermal, all those are our wonderful renewables. They're still marginal. Maybe currently it's not 1%, maybe that's 2% currently, but it don't change things much. We don't have any marginal renewable electricity. We barely have any renewable electricity in the mix. We need to understand that the world is largely powered by oil, coal, and natural gas. And uh, the only reason why sometimes we have marginal renewable energy is a poor integration, a grid integration, and sometimes it's also administrative barriers. Uh, and we also have a really like green sector. It's a biomass. I'm going to talk about it as well. It's very interesting. So what's biomass here? So BMS by far is the world's largest source of renewable energy. It's great, unless you understand what it actually is. Much of the world population uses wood, charcoal, straw, and animal dung as cooking fuel, not for fun or recreational purposes. In the beginning of the 21st century, when an electric car can be launched into space just for fun, people said, chicken poop alight to cook their scarce, scarce food. Isn't it a disgrace for the human race? I believe, well, it is, and we can't really, we can't really do much about it currently. So I leave it, I leave it at this, and we'll, we're going to be, we're going to be uh, talking about the developed countries. And Goose's law of survival. Again, now something seemingly, seemingly, seemingly irrelevant. The first law, the weak are meat, the strong do eat. The second law. The second law of survival states that there is no second law. Eat or be eaten, that's it. The third law, renewable energy is the energy of the weak and poor. Fossil fuel energy is the energy of the strong and rich. And there is no third law, I just made it up. Is it is going electric is so bad? Well, it's not quite as bad because uh, the second law limit, now we're talking about the second law of thermodynamics, not the second goose law. Uh, the devices that have thermal energy as input are, about, are bound to have low efficiency. That's pretty much it. And thermal to electric energy conversion ratio is approximately 3.3 .3 to one and four to one allowed for unavoidable storage losses. So if we're talking about replacing, substitute, substituting uh, oil, coal, and gas with renewable electric, uh, uh, renewable electricity, then those, those sectors, they, they shrink. They shrink because electricity is much more valuable, uh, valuable source than, uh, than thermal fuels. And, uh, and that's, 
the new chart is going to look a little bit different on the next slide, but I just want like to, to mention that most of the energy must not be stored and consumed in, and, and consumed in real time. Uh, the need for grid level storage is highly overstated. And I just suspect this is some sort of primitive rudimentary urge for accumulation. And in general, the smart and greater rare renewable energy based grid is, the less there is a need for grid scale storage. Of course, storage is still essential, especially for uh, smooth grid integration. So now I renormalized this global energy consumption uh, to show that going full electric is not that bad as it seems. Uh, and in this scale, total electricity production in the world, industrial world, industrial world, I still leave biomass as is, that green sector still exists, uh, is the crazy 2.1 times. Am I being too optimistic here? I think so, probably three times. But yeah, let's, let's leave it at two. So for example, in order to just get rid of all coal and replace it with wind and solar originated electricity, generation of wind and solar must increase about 10 times. So to just get rid of coal, which is a major source of electricity in the world currently. Going full electric is not that bad, but the capacity of all the transmission and distribution infrastructure must increase at least two times. And again, I say this, this seems to be very optimistic, it'll probably be three. This includes doubling the power density in densely populated areas where most energy is consumed. Uh, grid protection will have to increase even more than it is now as highly dispersed renewable energy sources are likely to catch more lightnings, major source of grid failures. Grids must be significantly redesigned to be able to accept large amount of highly variable input, both centralized and decentralized. And fully electric world's grids must be very different for, from what we have now. We are talking about completely new energy paradigm. And my observation, infrastructure upgrades with the provision for substantial increase of electricity consumption and substantial increase of renewables in the mix is, are just not happening. The world is not even preparing to it. Nobody, public media, decision makers, even talking seriously about it. While generating electricity from renewables. And I would like to quote Captain Obvious, wind turbines are huge. Yes, they are. But in their defense, I would like to say that the energy yield ratio, it is the ratio of energy generated by a system over its service life to the energy required to make it is greater than 20. So think about it. One wind turbine generates 20 times more electricity than it takes to build it. It's highly sustainable, at least in terms of replicating itself. And it has relatively low power density, two to four watts per meter squared. And I'll show you later why it matters. As for solar, power density is somewhat higher, five to 10 watts per meter squared, depending on location. And energy yield ratio depends on location as well. Sent from Northern Europe, 3.5 to four. Australia, Africa, other sunny places, 6.5 to eight. Well, at least they can sustain themselves. So they like 6.5, eight times. Energy payback period for solar panels will be sitting somewhere between three to six years for wind turbine basically real time. First 10 to 12 months of operation of a wind turbine, a wind turbine returns energy investments. But there's one very important thing. Renewable sources like wind and sun can't be controlled and they are non-dispatchable. This means that the grid must be prepared to absorb everything or almost everything that is generated. They must be technically prepared to absorb the bulk of energy supplied by non-dispatchable sources. No single kilowatt hour must be lost. Grid integration of non-dispatchable energy is the problem requiring special attention. Practical example, in order to power, and this is, this is from, the, from, the, from the post. Uh, from the post I made uh, for, uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the TCA blog. In order to power a fleet of 40 million Tesla S using wind turbines, uh, the way cars are, pre are presently used in the United Kingdom, we need a me mega farm with their area about 3,600 square kilometers, twice the area of Greater London, which is with about 6,400 wind turbines uh, with five megawatts uh, nameplate capacity. Each turbine can power approximately 6,000 electric cars lifetime. Sounds like a good news, but news, this is all wind generating capacity the United Kingdom currently has. A moral dilemma here. One five megawatt wind turbine can power more than 6,000 large electric sedans, yet 
you can make only two, three hundred sedans from one wind turbine. They're competing for the same resources. Which one is more important? Well, I don't know. Renewable energy is going to be everywhere. This must become the new normal if the world wants enough sustainable renewable energy to keep functioning. Rooftop solar, offshore wind farm visible from the beach, endless, endless fields of solar panels, gigantic hydropower plants, possible large tidal, uh, tidal hydro as well, and regarded as source, and regardless of the source, much more power lines. That's power lines are going to be multiplied. Renewable generating facilities allowing a country size country to live on renewables are comparable in scale with the size of that country. Are there any social obstacles in the way of renewable ambitions? NIMBY mate. And a lot of them, wind turbines, they kill birds, they're too big, they're too ugly, too noisy, wind's not always blowing, not in my backyard, they take more energy to build than they ever make, blades are non-recycled, checkmate, rooftop solar, that's my favorite. No, they spoil visual amenity of the street, they will reduce value of properties in the neighborhood. PV farms, too expensive, sun is not always shining. They take more energy to manufacture than they ever make. They create visual pollution, too expensive, shallow water, shallow water, deep water offshore, too expensive, not near my birds, not near my fish, not near my radar, not near my fancy sea oceanside property, not near my yacht. Solar thermal concentrators, too expensive, too immature, too large, fries birds. Waste by biogas, landfill gas, too smelly and messy. I don't want to sort my liter. Nuclear, well, it's not really renewable, renewable, but it's useful and worth mentioning. I have a deeply seated irrational fear of radiation. Definitely NIMBY. Well, fair enough, this one. Uh, real estate industry is one big foe of decentralized renewable, sustainable housing measures, and all that based on perceived interference with uh, renewable energy, uh, with paper value of properties. Maybe it's just easier to live on firewood, beer fuels. No, it's not. This is this chemical formula, what plants do, do to, to light, to, to light and carbon dioxide. And then and the formula down underneath is what we do to carbohydrates to, to extract energy. The plants are essentially three to 6% efficient in converting solar radiation into chemical energy. For comparison production, Solar panels convert about 20% of solar radiation into electrical energy. So chemical to electric conversion is 3.3 to one. This makes solar electric generators more than 10 times more effective than uh, evolution forged plants in converting solar radiation into usable electric power. This in turn highlights the fundamental flaw of simplistic idea of using first generation biofuels as sustainable fuels for power plants and resource for production of for beer diesel when we have much advanced, much more advanced technology as photovoltaics. Solar panels placed on the same area of land produce more than 10 times more electricity than the best GMO crops, not to mention farming trees for this purpose. This is simply deforestation with extra steps and substantial particulate air pollution. Are first generation biofuels renewable? Yes, they are. Are they sustainable? Not at all. Besides everything else, first generation biofuels directly compete for land with food production. The only inevitable and unavoidable bio waste might be used as biofuel if, of course, our priority is to stop the destruction of the global ecosystem. And in that sense, all of the bio waste, all of it must be used for energy to avoid environmental damage caused by uncontrolled biodegradation and associated methane emissions. Biogas is also useful for combined cycle uh, gas turbines, power plants as means of providing controllability to re renewable energy, or renewable based grids. Okay, wonderful technologies. Electrical world, superconductors, actually increasing, increasing electricity production multiple times uh, makes the case for the superconductors. Superconductors are not just about levitating magnets. You'll be surprised. Uh, there are 600 meters, for example, three-phase superconducting cable commissioned production cable operating in the grid in 2008. Ecoswing, full-scale 3.6 megawatts grid superconducting connected superconducting wind turbines was operating for 10 months, then successfully test was successfully completed. The superconductors don't use copper and only moderate amounts of rare earth materials. Cables can carry much higher power densities, which is absolutely important and uh, needed to deliver maybe three, four times more electricity to densely populated areas without needing for high voltage and save about half of all transmission losses. Magic, electrification of the world. From the technical point of view, full electrification of the world without the use or very limited use of fossil fuels is a tough task. 
which requires a lot of engineering, substantial resources, energy, concrete, structural, electrical, steel, aluminum, copper. But it's, it's standard engineering. We need to understand that with limited or moderate to low technical risks and novelty. Technologies exist, they're mature, they're actually highly useful and ready for wide adoption. Fully electric world also creates the case for compact and highly efficient superconducting power devices, transmission cables, superconducting magnet energy storage, oil free transformant, wind turbines, fault current limiters, traction motors. Would you like to buy a superconducting bus, sir? By the way, we sit on them, on those technologies, but never use them to any reasonable extent of their true potential. We have pretty much alien tech technology in our pocket. Yes, we do. Yet, we are using rather rudimentary methods to generate electricity by setting stuff alight. Why? Well, I just want to talk a little bit about just one really wonderful fossil fuel technology, combined cycle gas turbine power plant. Combined cycle gas turbine power plant has almost doubled the efficiency of a conventional coal-fired power plant. Emissions per kilowatt hour electric energy is just 337 grams per kilowatt hour, whereas coal-fired power plant does nearly a kilogram and typical typical ones go even over a kilogram. And what's very important about combined cycle, power, combined cycle uh, gas turbines, they are highly dispatchable or controllable and can operate on waste originated biogas, landfill gas, biodigesters, and renewable energy originated hydrogen. But for some reason, we don't see too many of them. New coal-fired power plants are still approved building commissions, sometimes with scandal of fines, but still do. Just watch that, we'll, you'll have a chance, I'll, we'll send, send out the presentation, you'll have a chance to follow all those links. Uh, so uh, one colloquial formulation of the second law of thermodynamics, you can't win. And that is really annoying because our, our fossil fuel systems are generally low efficiency. But the upside of this annoying law is that if we run the heat engine in reverse powering it with say electricity, we can achieve output more than input, provided large enough reservoir of heat is available. The COP coefficient of performance of a heat pump can easily achieve 250 to 300%. In certain conditions, 500% are not, not so uncommon. It's not magic, of course, it's not over unity, but it's as close as people can get to the free energy. So we all know that, we all know them, that's refrigerators and air conditioners uh, and heat, uh, heat pumps, and they are pretty much everywhere. Natural gas is commonly used to provide house heating and, anno and hot water with rather mediocre efficiency. So basically, if we use uh, combined cycle, uh, combined cycle uh, gas turbine power plant to power our heat pumps at houses, we can achieve a coefficient of performance, say 150, maybe even 200% of, of, of energy. So we can get even more energy as if we burned all this fuel on site and somehow converted 100% of it into heat. This is how good it is. But well, um, ma like mass usage of heat pump, hot water, for example, is not happening again. It's, it's still, it's still, it's available in the market, but yeah, there's no, there's no policies about them, nothing. So, and the same as combined cycle gas turbines. It seems like, it seems like they're trying to burn as much fuel as possible. So standpoint of renewable energy economy, fossil fuels are finite and eventually all energy will be renewable or non-renewable, but reasonably sustainable, such as nuclear fission or generation for nuclear fusion or gen like generation for nuclear fission. In general, eventually all the energy will be non-fossil fuel originated. And let me, let me quote a book again. This must be true since fossil fuels are finite and available quantities can only, discrete, uh, can only decrease over time. Yet. There is no such, there's no certainly certainty about the time of this eventually or about how much damage from climate change might occur before renewable energy transition. There are still three dynamics that affect the speed of this the three transition, rising fossil fuel costs, declining renewable energy costs and implementing policies to speed the transition, including policies that internalize externalities to reflect the true cost of fossil fuels implementing policies to speed the transition, including policies that internalize externalities to reflect the true costs of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are, very, are the very foundation of modern wealth and power, pun intended. The right of a corporation to externalize environmental and social costs is almost sacred. This is what keeps the economy going. Is it reasonable to expect truly effective policies that internalize externalities of fossil fuel power from those in position of power, pun still intended? 
And I just want to show this little graph from uh, from the uh, from the Sam is just writing to me two minutes left. I'm trying I'm trying trying to go faster. Uh, we can show this plot shows uh, GDP per capita uh, as of the you know, power consumption versus GDP per capita. We see a lot of a lot of variability, but in general, the higher the rich, the, you know, the more money a country has, the more the higher the economy, the more energy is consumed. Yet we can see that the variability, even among rich countries, can be as high as three times. For example, Hong Kong. They're using it just 80 kilowatt hours per person per day primary fuel usage, whereas the United States sits at 250 kilowatt hours per person per day. The best sustainable energy is the energy that has never been used. Sustainable world conserves energy and resources. Sustainable energy is a completely different energy and economy paradigm. Is it going to happen? Well, honestly, I'm skeptical. What is, how large is one kilowatt hour? And I just wanna share one of my experience, one of the craziest things I ever done on my bicycle. I rode 200, 231 kilometers in one day and I finished it under one, nine, one to nine hours. So how much energy I actually, how much work I actually made? Wonderfully, I have a power meter on my bike so I can tell. Average mechanical output was 169 watts and moving time was slightly under eight hours, 30 minutes. So mechanical useful work is 1.43 kilowatt hours. And I had to eat 5,749 kilocalories of extra food to compensate for, for, that, for that energy consumption. So supermarket fed vegan emissions, I'm sort of supermarket fed vegan, 7.5 kilograms of CO2 equivalent. Traditionally fed modern human, 18.8 .8 kilograms of CO2 equivalent. So human powered emissions per kilometer traveled, balanced vegan calories, 7.5 kilograms per 231 kilometers, 32.5 grams per kilometer, mixed meat-based, 81.4 grams per kilometer. And small, small political or historic remark, one kilowatt hour is approximately the amount of useful work per day that can be expected from a very loyal industrial servant or a slave doing hard physical labor. Remember, we were talking about probably 20 to 80 kilowatt hours per person per day of useful, useful energy currently in the rich world. That's the difference and the between you know, old times and new times. And you just now can understand how much, how many lives it took to build all those amazing, amazing, huge, you know, historical, historical buildings and whatever things. And the luxury, just the luxury of all times elites is beyond beyond any imagination. So if it was an electric bike, then it would just consume 2.31, 2.4 kilowatt, uh, kilowatt hours electric energy. So light electric bike, light electric vehicle energy consumption, well, one kilowatt hour per 100 kilometers. The best conventional electric vehicle, just a car, 15 kilowatt hours electric per 100 kilometers. And emissions, if both of them charged their batteries from 100% mainstream qualified power plants, 10 grams per an e for an e-bike, 153 grams for an EV. If this was a bike generator with the battery, we would generate only 0.86 kilowatt hours electric energy. And the emissions would be insane. So don't believe anyone who is trying to sell you a bike generator to live off the grid sustainably. This is, this is completely insanity. We, we emit, even if we're eating vegan, we need to emit approximately nine kilograms per kilowatt hour electric. And now transportation emissions by mode. And I'd like to take some time, late it's sinking all, all this table. I know this is a big table, but this is, this emissions comparing push bike, push bike, uh, depending on a, on, on a diet, electric bike, conventional electric EV and petrol car, uh, CV. And also I included walking. So look at those numbers, equivalent emissions per, per kilometer traveled, especially pay attention to walking uh, on meat and dairy based omnivore diet. And compare it with petrol car, conventional electric car, e-bike, all that. So energy, efficiency of our food matters a lot. 
And I wanted to give a message to the least protected and most vulnerable social group, uh, white cisgender males, uh, that riding bikes is masculine enough. You don't have to have a huge SUV to prove that you're a male or especially, yeah. And uh, are you tough enough to man up? And I think fortunately I'm running out of time and I had an amazing part about electric cars, conventional cars and comparison and actually uh, all that. And I, I, have to, I have to I have to skip through those slides. You'll have a chance to read them uh, once, once we send, send, send out the presentation. So I'll jump through those, but those I'm really proud of them, and probably will, this is this will become the the topic for the next for the next presentation. Uh, okay, this is the only thing I would like to I would like to would like to say: electric cars are carbon dioxide emissions futures. This is your we are obligated to emit approximately forty tons of carbon dioxide in the future when we buy an electric car. Uh, Yes, and I just made a funny one and another one which is not so funny one. And it's not so funny one because this is world scientists warning to humanity dated back 1992. And this is your government in 1992. And this is your government today where uh, atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide has increased drastically. And unfortunately, again, I have to skip through all of it, all this wonderful text. Uh, maybe some, yeah, even, even this. Just I want to say that no single technical solution is going to magically fix current problems. The idea of some future techno salvation hoping for human ingenuity, ingenuity, well, the life supporting portion of the planet is literally burning and degrading in real time is well, literally delusional. So is it possible to power the world without warming the climate? Well, generally, yes. Technically, it's challenging, but viable. Obstacles are mostly political and social. The world is resisting any sensible changes. Can it ever lose resistance and become superconducting? So why are fossil fuels so entrenched? Let's ask John Rimbowski. <sighs> I'm sorry, taking a bit longer time. Hope everyone enjoyed. All right. Oh, can you see my screen? Okay. I can't quite see what I'm sharing. It's always a way. How's that looking? Okay. Yeah, oh, just just, just start just start start the presentation. You can make right. it full screen uh, if you fancy. Is it not full screen now? It should be. No, no. It's we the see the thumbnails. You see the thumbnails on the left, um, hmm. but it's still good. You can click top left from beginning, maybe. Yeah, it's it's because I've got a monitor as well, so it's doing it on yeah. both. It's it's also fine like this. So yeah, just kept, oh, oops, that looks a bit funny. <laughs> Whatever you did before, is uh, that, it's fine. How's that? Is that that's not probably not good. <laughs> I can't see what's there. So. Yeah, definitely exit that and to go to whatever it was before. Oh. I'd recommend. Are we back? Yep. F5. Yeah, that's perfect. That's there perfect. we go. Jesus, I hate technology sometimes. Sorry about that. Um, well, I'll do a, thanks Arky, that was great. I'm not gonna be able to do anything uh, quite in that depth. And I think since Arky offered the disclaimer, I'll offer one too, which is, that I am not a competent and experienced experimental physicist. I'm a recent politics and international relations graduate, um, but I'm currently working as a research assistant with uh, the Energy Global Research Priority Group at Warwick University. And you know, the politics of sustainable energy is something I've studied this year. It's something I'm interested in. Um, I don't claim to be an expert on it at all, but I thought I'd just give a kind of whistle-stop tour into you know, the politics and some of the issues as I understand them. Uh, so yeah. So um, this is a definition of sustainable energy, which I quite liked. It's kind of in contrast to Arky's one, but uh, not really, it's, they're compatible. A dynamic harmony between the equitable 
availability of energy intensive goods and services to all people and the preservation of the earth for future generations. It's a little bit anthropocentric, this definition, but for this purpose, it will do. Um, the energy trilemma is quite an important thing to outline at the start as well. This is quite a good starting point for understanding why policy making is not quite as straightforward as it may seem. So uh, these are the three things that energy policymakers have to contend with and have to think about when they're trying to come up with energy policies. So the first one is energy security, which has two sides to it, the supply side, so the uninterrupted availability of energy sources at an affordable price, and the demand side, ensuring fossil fuel industries remain strong. Well, that's, that's what it has been at the moment. Uh, the second is environmental sustainability, so uh, or emissions reduction. So energy is the highest emitting sector if you take agriculture and transport into account. Uh, and energy equity, so energy seen as a developmental goal. The International Energy Agency estimates that 2.8 billion people don't have access to clean cooking uh, equipment or clean cooking facilities, while 1.1 billion people have no electricity, though this is improving. Um, and it's crucial to understand also that these goals can be in competition, so particularly at points in time when governments have to decide between popular choices and long-term benefits. So fossil fuels have a very long investment profile, and for governments, it's how they balance this with medium term demands and the longer needs to phase out. Well, that is the paradigm they've had in their heads for years. Um, and the fossil fuel lobbies have successfully relied on this kind of argument of the lights going out so that suddenly we wouldn't have any power. Um, and the economic growth argument to slow sustainable change down. Uh, so in light of this and in light of Aki's presentation, I'll be touching on two uh, questions today. Um, so the firstly, what are the political barriers stopping the transformation of our energy systems? And secondly, what are some potential solutions or ways of overcoming these barriers? Uh, so for some historical context, um, fossil fuels are deeply intertwined with economic growth and development. So the development of coal powered steam engines in the early 19th century kind of meant a move from what uh, Wrigley terms an organic economy. So an economy in which solar energy flows and uh, outputs were measured in terms of vegetation uh, were the dominant forms of energy and this transformation to a mineral based economy in which society added to solar flows using accumulated stockpiles of solar energy, so coal, meaning that the productivity of the land was no longer a constraint on growth. And quite a good way of conceptualizing this is goes back to something Arki said, which is muscle power. So um, Heinberg has quite a good quote about this, which is, if we were to add together the power of all of the fuel-fed machines that we rely on today, and then compare that with the amount of power that can be generated by the human body, we would find that each American has the equivalent of over 150 energy slaves working for us 24 hours a day. That's just to get a sense of the scale that we're talking about. Um, and going back to the physics, you know, the increased energy density and ubiquity of fossil fuels compared to organic fuels in agrarian societies prior created this kind of new agrarian colonial political economy that centralized and industrialized in the global north while necessitating large amounts of human labor or slavery in the global south. Um, so it's not quite as simple as saying that coal was simply more efficient or had greater technical superiority. It's also the case that it allowed for the concentration of wealth and power into the hands of a few industrialists who congregated new urban centers compared to the kind of less geo-specific organic economy that had come beforehand. Um, and a good quote here is that the quality of life enjoyed by the developed nations today is due in large part to the availability and plentif of plentiful and affordable fossil fuels over the last century. Um, two good kind of theoretical concept for understanding this are carbon democracy and fossil capitalism. I'm, I won't go into these now because we don't have the time, but I would seriously suggest that you know, you look into them as something you're interested in, basically describe how the rise to prominence of fossil fuels has fundamentally shaped our political context. Um, and they're interesting, but, you know, time is of the essence. So the first modern paradigm I want to explore is that of fossil fuel hegemony or carbon entanglement. So hegemony is a kind of political science term that means the predominance of one group or norm over others in relation to having explicit or implicit power over others. So, for example, the very basic fact that many countries' geopolitical statuses and relative economic standing on the global stage are predicated on the presence of fossil fuel reserves within their borders. And this has been institutionalized in party politics. So quite a good study by Young Coutinho in 2013 detailed how the Canadian and Australian governments 
had used tactics of public denial and skepticism, claims of compliance through statistical manipulation, the economic argument, so Australia is heavily coal reliant, Canada is very oil dependent, uh, appeals to nationalism, exporting the problem elsewhere. So for example, Britain saying that it only emits 1% of global emissions and therefore doesn't have to bother. Um, controlling the research that was done by universities and shifting the targets to suit themselves. Um, on top of this, you have uh, bodies like the Koch industry or the Koch brothers in the USA who have lobbied the US government for tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. I think they contributed uh, hundreds of millions to the 2012 election, 90% of which went to the Republican Party, and then more subtle media manipulation, uh, like Rupert Murdoch's empire. At one point, he had an empire that reached 44% of the US population, which and he was actively promoting contrarian scientists who were disseminating uncertainty about facts with widespread scientific consensus. And finally, cultural norms. So this touches on what Arky was talking about. There's a book called Automobile Politics by uh, Matthew Patterson. It's a really interesting book and basically details how climate change is a cultural and behavioral issue too. Um, and the car has come to symbolize so much more than simply a means of transport, but something of value, status, and individual worth, which kind of entrenched its prominence in society. And you only really have to look at the way our cities are designed to see just how dominant the car has become as a cultural norm. Um, so the second group of uh, modern paradigms, um, path dependency and lock-in. So path dependency is this term in political science, which basically, basically describes how agents will go down a particular path due to ideological, political and social commitments that filter learning and choice making opportunities. So a really trivial example of this is a QWERTY keyboard, the keyboard that we all have on our laptops, which is has been proven by many studies that it's not the most ergonomic nor efficient layout for an alphanumeric keyboard, and yet it has persisted. And that's the kind of thing that just becomes institutionalized and then we, we take it for granted. And this has happened with fossil fuel economy through a process which uh, UNRU calls carbon lock-in. So the phenomenon whereby industrial economies become locked in to fossil fuel-based energy systems due to self-reinforcing positive interactions between technological, governmental, and socio-economic systems. And this means that demonstrably superior alternatives, uh, as Arki has shown, for example, renewable energy technologies can be locked out by incumbents. In this case, the fossil fuel industry and sympathetic political actors that are resistant to change and create specific pathways for incremental change that do not challenge the status quo. And actually one of the most compelling arguments have been put forward by critical scholars recently in terms of the uptake of renewable sources is that the primary problem with solar and wind is not their intermittency, i.e. the variability of the energy that flows from them to power our homes, but the fact that they represent unenclosable commons, i.e. resources that cannot be easily monopolized or commodified. The third modern paradigm is this is called depoliticization. So basically, the process through which power has increasingly been taken out of the hands of those in institutionalized politics and placed in the hands of the market. The hollowing out of the state, which has been happening since the 1980s under Thatcher and Reagan in what political scientists called neoliberalism. Um, and at the local level, this means that there is often a disparity between the state's ambitions of kind of stated ambitions of local governmental climate action and its manifestation due to lack of capacity and power. Um, in the case of energy policy, this has manifested itself in a massive over-reliance on the private sector that has really stymied the rapid, the rapid tra transformation we require. Um, and it also means that citizens are never consulted by institutions during in innovation. We exert very marginal influence as consumers. We may have a tiny part to play in regulatory controls, but rarely are we central to prior deliberation, decision or development on energy infrastructure projects. Um, and you know, depoliticization has left the state woefully ill-equipped to deal with complex and massive issues. We saw that with the COVID-19 crisis in the UK, and it is also being played out with the climate crisis. Um, I think Arki covered externalities, but externality is basically the idea that uh, measures like carbon pricing or carbon markets abstract carbon from its reality, its biophysical reality, and pretend that increased economic growth predicated on the consumption of biophysical resources is compatible with sustainability. And fundamentally, fossil fuels are entropic. So meaning once the energy has dissipated, it can't be used again, and it's a fundamentally uh, unsustainable economic model. And this is coupled with uh, a limited democracy, short-term election cycles, which breed self-interest and mean that policies which are unsexy, so for example, the retrofit policy, which was scrapped in the UK, which I'll come on to, are not picked up by politicians. So that's a lot. 
Uh, what can we do about it? Well, as I see it, there are three areas that we can explore. I'm not saying that these are necessarily the solutions, but they are things that I think offer some hope. Uh, so the first is technological innovation. It's clearly important. Uh, as Aki outlined, we have so much knowledge and uh, the infrastructure is there now. And so that means that the economic argument is increasingly viable. Um, renewables are the fastest growing source of electricity. 25% of the global energy output in 2019 was renewable sources. Um, but this innovation cannot be abstracted from power relations. And when it is, it's quite a dangerous lie. It's this idea of technological determinism, the idea that humankind's technological progress and rational thought will be able to overcome any external limitations. Um, so for example, electric vehicles, uh, they're hailed as this great new thing that's gonna take us out of the uh, fossil fuel dark ages, but uh, they are in intrinsically political. And you know, 85% of cobalt mines are in the Democratic Republic of Congo and have been linked to severe human rights abuses for years. And actually a lawsuit was filed in early 2020 against Microsoft, Apple, Google, and Tesla, and more, alleging that children were being killed while mining for cobalt in the DRC. So all of these decisions that we make are intrinsically political as well. You can't just take them on face value as technological innovations. Um, and actually a lot of the time, you know, this, these moonshot uh, technologies required for green growth. So things like, for example, Bill Gates has suggested geoengineering the sun. Um, these tend to be advanced by billionaires who build bunkers in New Zealand to prepare for the apocalypse while kind of betting the ability, habit, hab oh, I can't say that word, habitability, there we go, of the planet on the faint hope of a miracle cure that's nowhere to be seen. As Arki has said, the technology is already there. What we need is to implement it. We don't need to rely on savior billionaires to do so. Um, and one idea I just thought I'd put in is this idea of the entrepreneurial state, which is quite an interesting strand in kind of new political economic thought, uh, which is that maybe government investment um, is a good way of promoting innovation that comes with a social conscience. So making sure that the state has a say in innovation and has a hand in it. And, you know, Keynes, who, you know, John Maynard Keynes, the influential 20th century economist said that the important thing for government is not to do which, in, not to do things which individuals are doing already, but to do things which at present are not done at all. Um, and, you know, I think that's a, a book worth reading if that's something you're interested in. Uh, secondly, so solution number two, policy decisions and co-benefits. So I'm sure you've all heard the phrase just transition and Green New Deal. They're getting bandied about a lot. Um, I don't have time to go into them now in depth, but you know these are some of the things that are being discussed. So a just transition is the idea that an energy transition creates winners and losers. So employment in new energy sectors might be in different places and require different skills to those of old energy. And you know, it fundamentally, it's the citizens of fossil fuel dependent countries that will bear the brunt if their governments do not adopt more sustainable practices. Uh, these kind of transitions are therefore deeply political and require the engagement with stakeholders from across society and an informed government steering the ship. So the Green New Deal is an example of this and it's being touted in uh, the EU and in the States. Um, and one element of this I really like is the fact that it acknowledges how historically oppressed groups like indigenous peoples, people of color, migrants and so on are more likely to bear the brunt of climate change um, and according to any standards of justice ought to be consulted in any policy making decisions. Um, a second thing is co-benefits. So the idea that you can construct policies or at the moment you have to construct pol policies that have uh, multiple benefits for, for people who would adopt them in order to gain support. So for example, uh, uh, we'll skip over the demand side, supply side thing, but uh, retrofitting houses in the UK. So putting insulation in to houses and making them more energy efficient can not only lower costs and increase savings, but it, it means less likelihood of winter deaths in the UK, of which there are over 14,000 per year. Um, and actually at the moment, 3.5 million homes uh, in the UK live in what you know, political scientists call energy poverty where over 10% of the household income is spent on energy. And this would be vastly reduced if all homes were energy efficient. And the cost of the NHS at the moment is, is estimated at 22 billion pounds between 2015 and 2030 due to these uh, energy inefficiencies. So that gives you an idea of the kind of gains that we could be making. And that's the kind of policy making 
that needs to be pushed at the moment if it's going to be let through. And the Switzerland vote very quickly uh, is an example of how not to do that. Uh, because a recent vote in Switzerland, it was only a few days ago, that lost 51% to 49% on a carbon dioxide law that would have raised fees and taxes on fossil fuels, failed because it didn't make strong enough economic reasons uh, for increased climate action. So we need more effective communication. Um, and finally, um, the idea of energy democracy. So how do we inculcate processes of deliberation and consensus building within uh, within local communities. And the thing is that local energy cooperatives and renewables in particular are amazing for decentralization. Solar panels can be put up and batteries can be stored. Uh, and this offers opportunity for the redistribution both of energy and political power. Um, and so by switching the narrative from consumer to producer, um, for example, in Germany, community energy, 42% of renewable energy is owned by citizens. And its growth was built on generous feed-in tariff schemes, which were low risk and funded by the government. So that's the kind of involvement and uh, political involvement in, you know, in these schemes that can really make a difference. Um, and technologies such as rooftop solar, ground heat, small scale biogas, relocate energy production to the site of consumption. Um, and community energy products can really lower the entry cost for the purchase of things like solar panels as well, which can seem uh, extortionally expensive uh, for individuals. Uh, another concept is that of energy justice. So this is moving more to the global south. And it's the idea that we can't really hope to move, move to a post oil society if energy poverty in the global south is not explicitly addressed. And actually, renewable energy technologies offer some hope here, as in the absence of kind of state led grid extensions in communities without access to power. Mini grids powered by solar panels and battery storage mean that power can be generated locally. And this means that things like blackouts are significantly less likely and energy demand can be satisfied directly. It also means that household expenditure is lowered while creating opportunities for women and girls to work and gain access to education due to a reduction of labor burden in traditional households. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of scope for radically increasing both access to energy and decreasing energy poverty with renewable energy technologies. Um, another thing that gives me hope is the role of towns and cities. Uh, kind of acting in between the local and national level. Cities are responsible for over 70% of global energy related CO2 emissions, but only 2% of land mass. Um, and for example, Copenhagen is aiming to be carbon neutral by 2025 because it's, they, you know, these cities are setting targets that explicitly exceed national targets. Um, so that's pretty cool. And finally, social movements, people power. That's a, that's a stuff I love. Um, so I'll give two examples here, the divestment movement, is a movement that started in the United States with a guy called Bill McKibben, uh, started as 350.org, uh, and it was $14 trillion now that they've got in pledges from hundreds of bodies worldwide to move money away from fossil fuel investment, which is incredible. It's not the whole answer, and it's, you know, it's not going to solve everything, but it does create a shift, and it means that for those that are financially minded, they can see an imperative to move their money elsewhere. And this recent one, which actually was, you know, I think within the last week was a battle against the Keystone Pipeline XL in the United States. It was a 13 year battle, a pipeline that would have carried more than 800,000 barrels of tar sand crude oil uh, per year, which is the most carbon intensive kind of oil. Um, and after years of protests, sit-ins, acts of civil disobedience, including hundreds of arrests, it was finally scrapped on June the 9th of this year. Um, so that kind of thing gives me hope as well. And I've been talking for, well, not too long, but probably longer than I should have done. I realize it's late. So this is my conclusion. And I like this quote, uh, and I think it's definitely true. Um, actions at levels of social organization from the individual and household to communities and formal organizations and onto the national and international scales can all make meaningful contributions to mitigating climate change. And that is 100% true in the energy sector as with everywhere else. So yeah, I'll leave you with that. Thanks for listening. Message me for a source list. And I will now try to stop sharing my screen, but I will fail to do so and make a mess of it. There we go. Awesome stuff, John. Thank you so much. Uh, yours and Argy's presentations have been absolutely phenomenal. Um, what I'm going to do now is quickly share uh, my phone screen so I, I can do a quick demonstration of the app. So let's try and get this to work. Okay, can we all see my screen and can we all hear me okay? 
Yep. Does that yep. work? Okay, great. So I'll just do this for a quick few minutes. Um, I apologies, I'm slightly tired because it's past midnight here where I am in Bulgaria. Um, I think Argy did a great job at, at being uh, being on it at 6 a.m. as well. So here's, uh, here's the onboarding process. Um, it's quite a simplistic one at the moment. What we're going to do later on for the app is depending on someone's um, knowledge on the climate issues, they're going to get different onboarding processes. But here's here's, a, here's the initial one we're going to start off with. So, you know, for the planet, use this app to help build a movement of carbon cutters, reduce your CO2, complete challenges, track cha changes and win awards, uh, share, share your actions and ideas to motivate your network, community, get inspired by others, help grow the movement and save our planet. So let's get started. So let's uh, let's do a, a full registration. Um, it's only going to take a second, to be honest. Uh, let's um, create a little test account. So let's here's a little trick for everyone. You can put plus anything, and it creates another account, and it still sends it to your original email address. So let's do this. Okay, join now. Okay, so before we start with the app, let's calculate a rough carbon footprint for you in just six questions. So, so we're trying to mark, we're trying to basically appeal to a lot of people. So we don't want to give them a hundred questions. They can answer more questions later on. Um, but certainly for now, we think people's attention span is probably just good enough for about six questions. And it actually gives a good enough carbon footprint uh, to good enough accuracy for someone to be able to then uh, see the difference of, of challenges and how it changes with your carbon footprint. So let's go. So in a typical year, do you fly? Yes. Do you drive? Yes. Diesel, roughly how far per week? Small. Do you use green energy in your home? Let's say yes. How many people do you live with? Let's say two. How many bedrooms does your house have? One. Are you, uh, I'm a fish eater at the moment, trying to be vegan. Uh, let's say, let's move that out there. Fish eater, calculating your current carbon footprint. So my carbon footprint is about 11 tons. Uh, so let's finish that. So um, here is uh, the fee page. We've got three main sections, feed, the challenges, and the profile page. So let's have a look at the challenges first of all. So we've got the six categories up at the top, uh, home, transport, food, finance, uh, voice it, which is similar to activism and other. Uh, so for example, we can have a look at uh, let's say the reduce meat challenge. So we click that. Why do it? Meat consumption contributes to 14.5% of global CO2 emissions. It's the seventh top action that you can do. So in these little pop-ups, in these uh, really nice bite-sized bite information for why people should do it, great education can happen in that. Uh, and as you can see, it's got a little label saying it's a top challenge. So let's start that. How many meat surfings do you have in a typical week? So let's say we have, uh, well, at the moment, I don't have any, but let's say I do have two. Uh, so then we get a graph. The graph is a bit uh, not easy to understand at the moment, but we'll be improving that. Uh, so you've got your goal and where you're currently at in yellow. And then you've got steps for how to do it. So it's saying here, try swapping beef to, and lamb for chicken and pork, swap meat for fish and replace fish with tofu, lentils, beans, nuts, and soy. And then we, so we can break down these actions later on and we can allow people to tick it. But let's just say that, um, let's say we finish that. And these, these actions will be posted on your own feed. So you can see the graph, you can see all the positive things that you've done. So Sam has recorded they are fish eater. Sam has recorded they're using green energy at home. Uh, and then we can start following other people. So let's do that. Let's follow Kristen, who's one of the awesome developers. She's been working at um, WhatsApp for several years. Uh, so let's follow some of her accounts. Um, network error. So this is, of course, uh, still a beta app. So some things might not work. Uh, but that loaded quite fast. They've been working on that at the moment. So Kristen has completed the challenge, eat sustainably. Kristen has completed the challenge swap to green energy. Uh, Kristen's been uh, tracking her flights. So you can see how her flights are changing over time. Uh, and so you get lots of positive things. I mean, uh, there's 
we had a little feature here which would be showing the stats um, of the community. So it would have stats such as five of your followers have swapped to green energy or 20 of your friends are vegan. You know, so seeing these statistics of the community, which is going to start being really powerful to influence you and to also to learn from each other. And you can talk about it and, you know, we can, you can add, you can take pictures um and and then add things so you know we've got a test test post and you can add a picture to it so so it's like instagram in that sense um and then you've got your profile page which is kind of a summary of ev of everything so you've got your home footprint at the top followers following you can see how your comfort footprint's broken down into the categories you've got your challenges in progress in fact let's let's complete one switch to green energy so this is fourth action, top action you can take. So let's start that. You've got some how to do it. You've got some links to other uh, companies. Let's say this is complete. We get a badge. It looks all nice. It helps. Uh, it makes you feel good. Uh, and then now it shows here. You've got challenges in progress complete. You've got your statistics of where you start, where you started and where you are now, total reduction. Uh, you've got graphs showing your hot showing it over time um so now let's go and set a goal and then we've got earthy here so we're at 14 tons and let's set our goal to be 10 tons so we can finish that and now we can see where your where your goal is and where you're currently at so i need to get that bar down um we've got a few things to improve on the ux uh, on the user experience side of things here we're testing it in groups at the moment so uh, we'll be feeding that into the design process um, but i think that's pretty much um, a very quick summary of the app so uh, i hope that made sense um, if there's any questions uh, please do let me know um, and if there isn't then i will now stop sharing so um, we have now gone over time by 13 minutes. So apologies for that, but uh, hopefully it's been quite engaging and interesting. Um, I don't know if we've, we can just, uh, if you've got any questions that you can answer quick, Arky. And I mean- Yeah, uh, there's, there's, there's a, couple, a couple of good questions. Uh, one question is from uh, Tim. Uh, there's no dispatchable energy isn't used immediately by the grid. What happens to it? Well, it, it's nothing happens to it. This is just lost opportunity. It's just gone because it's not used because if the grid can't absorb it, uh, that the source is not generating it basically. And uh, this is means this is, highlights the importance of the grids, the ability of the grids to absorb that energy because this is lost opportunities. Uh, renewable energy converters, they age pretty much regardless of whether or not we draw energy from them because they, they're exposed to a very aggressive environment. And that means they don't live to their full potential if that's not happening. And the nuclear fission, yeah, we know that. So in nuclear fission, there's still no kind of safely store waste and poor regulation around. That's all that. And I know it's not popular and I, that's why in, I, nuclear fission is useful, but again, very limited applications just because of those sort of issues but i still i still i still consider it as a useful source for sustainable energy especially as a, as a means of uh making a renewable energy based grids that give give them give them controllability because uh nuclear as well as uh gas turbines power plants they are very much very much dispatchable so they can be ramped up ramped down really fast and this is really important for the grids that produce bulk of electricity from renewable from from solar and solar solar and wind that, that the ones that are basically very cheap can be ramp, you know ramped up the production of that electricity really fast but they need support they need support and also the other one uh, uh, maybe just people just mistook me a little bit for my for my social joke uh yeah i didn't want i didn't want i didn't want to uh you know uh, offend offend any female cyclists uh, quite the opposite uh i think i was just i was just wanted to highlight that a lot of males they consider all those powerful male features uh, as really important part of their gender identity, like driving big cars, eating a lot of meat, engaging all sorts of basically the most horrible, horrible activities for the environment and actually other people. And they just wanted to highlight that, you know, 
riding a bike is not that feminine after all and it's not bad i mean it's not bad to be feminine it's really actually good and that's you know that gender role has to probably change i don't know it's probably more for john didn't want to offend anyone at all just you know tried to pay, probably make a joke about those people who abuse me countless time on the roads for just riding a bike and they just drive, drive those big cars and yelling horrible offenses out of their windows i don't know it's probably australian thing as well but it's all the time all that same group of people and i think this also probably have to change and it's also probably a, a, a good you know sort of indication that our social behavior has to change a lot and also our world and you know the quality and equity in the world has to has to actually improve massively but again i didn't want to just i didn't want to offend anyone i i'm really i'm really for gender equality by all possible means great thank you Aki. yeah there's certainly a lot of people out there with uh, with issues taken out on on males and females uh you know, all over the place for various reasons. Um, great stuff. Um, so I think we're now moving, I think we've finished with the questions, uh, perhaps. Um, so just quickly to round everything up, um, we're starting to group test the app. Um, you know, anyone out there, if you'd like to get involved, help the project in any way, you know, please reach out to us. Um, you know, we're all a huge team of volunteers. We're we're hoping to uh, now transition this to uh, enabling some people to be paid full time to help progress the project and to help uh, create this, this tool for the movement of action um, ASAP. So we're doing this invest uh, equity crowdfunding round soon. We're, we're just about to start filming the video. Um, we've got a few awesome lead investors uh, lined up, but we're looking for two or three more uh, so if there's any lead investors out there or anyone that would like to pledge a certain amount um, for us, that would be uh, really great. And then we can take that to uh, Crowdcube and Cedars, the platforms that's going to do this uh, next crowdfunding campaign for us. Uh, and then they can start doing their due diligence on us and our financial model, et cetera. So we need a, we need a few other people. Um, but uh, thank you all very much for watching. Um, please get involved and ask any questions uh, if you if uh, anything comes to mind. We'll send out the recording soon. Uh, thanks, Paul. Thanks, uh, uh, Henry, um, Wendy, for all of your questions and engagement, and Tim, uh, Louise. Um, and on that, unless there's anything else by anyone, yeah, yeah, Arky, yes. One thing. First of all, I missed the best part of my presentation, unfortunately. And first of all, I just want to ask if you like what you've seen right now, it, it's been like, consider this as a teaser, uh, just we'll, we'll do, we need, we need another popular demand and you know, bring friends if you want to, you want to see more. And also we definitely go into circulate, I go to, we're going to circulate my presentation, a PDF of my presentation. And that was the intention. That's why that's so much text in it. So we can have a look, but it definitely, especially the car, a part that I've worked on a lot and I didn't actually have even a chance to show it. Uh, I would like to probably maybe make, make, make the next topic. And you can actually ask for, for a topic. You can look at the presentation and ask for one of the topics because uh, any, any, of those, any of those slides can be expanded into 30 or 40 minutes presentation. So uh, yeah, that's, that's, that was my comment. But if you, if you like what you see, come for more and bring friends. Absolutely. We are, you know, it needs to be us who creates this movement of action. Um, you know, the tool will help. And uh, with with the knowledge and expertise of John and Arky, it's, it's definitely going to help lead the way. Uh, so I think on that note, unless there's anything from you, John, uh, thank you all so much. Um, have a lovely night, morning, wherever you are in the world. And uh, speak soon. And uh, see you later. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. much. Yeah. Bye.